Hi! All right, so welcome to Ridgely Love episode six. I think we're on. I really should be keeping track better. I think we're on episode six. Um, hi. So in the last episode, we finished the Mr. Ashcroft storyline. And I put up a poll and I said, hey, please let me know what storyline you want me to do next. And you guys chose Mr. Graham. I'm so excited. So for those of you who are not familiar with the game, or maybe you missed the first episode, um, this game is basically just choosing a eligible bachelor in the Regency era and courting them. And um, we, uh, we did one whole storyline. There are four three are good <laughs> and one is um one is like a quarter of a storyline and it's what happens if you really 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 mess up in any of the other storylines um <laughs> so the uh the the mr graham storyline is wonderful when i i did play all of these like years ago when i found out that this game was a thing um, I remember really, really enjoying the Mr. Graham storyline. I remember thinking that he was just so wonderful. So let's go ahead and make a new game. All right. Is that how you spell it? I don't know. Well, let's randomize. Okay. No. really wants okay let's go with that elizabeth sharp we are lizzie we're a nickname okay so we're gonna create a new character and we're going to go and we're going to woo mr graham <laughs> so let's go lizzie sharp town all delightful stories revolve around others, and so preoccupied you are with theirs that you do not notice stumbling upon your very own tale. So all the games start exactly the same. If you were here for the first episode, you would know this. Um, because you're going to see a few familiar things. But as, as I move on, you'll see less and less familiar things. But at the beginning of each game is like exactly word for word verbatim the same. As you arrive in the little town of Darlington, you encounter an air full of warm chatter and the scent of freshly break freshly baked bread. Not freshly baked breaked bed. <laughs> freshly breaked bed. While the sun shines overhead. A few of the townspeople smile when they see you before they return to their business and leave you to yours. You take a moment to survey the familiar people, the shops and cobblestones. It has been too long since you have felt so content. You see Mary approaching. She appears to be in very high spirits. Dearest Elizabeth, it is so good to see you out and about and in cheerful colors once more. If I'm not mistaken, it has been a year and a day, has it not? How are you feeling? Hmm. I'm as well as can be expected. There are times... Indeed. We all miss your father, Elizabeth. Papa still reminisces about their decades of friendship. Does anything in particular bring you to town today, or are you just taking some air and stretching your legs? Mama sent me on an errand to post a letter, but I am simply happy to breathe the fresh air. A letter. My cat is making noise. Addressed to your aunts? But I thought your mother and your aunt had always been at odds with each other. I dare say I am as baffled as you are. My attempts to pry any information from Mama were unsuccessful. Yes, that I, that's what I had supposed to. I questioned Mama this morning, but she refused to disclose the letter's contents. Hmm. We didn't solve that mystery in the other storyline. I wonder... I wonder which storyline has this. I don't remember. Well, I suppose there must be some urgent business behind this. I hope all is well, for you deserve great happiness, my dear Elizabeth. I'm sorry to be in such haste, but now I am also running some errands, albeit for my sisters. I do hope we will see each other again soon, Elizabeth. Yes, I cannot wait until we talk some more. Mary has made a fair point about the enmity 
between your mother and your aunt. You look at the letter in your hands and wonder if anything is amiss. You are suddenly afraid something ill has befallen your dear brother who has been estranged from your family for years and whom you have not seen since he left the household when you were a little girl. We didn't hear anything about that in the last storyline either. Maybe we'll get more closure for these random things. Sorry, husband's texting me. Oops. <laughs> Dispel your you dispel your anxiety by reminding yourself that Mama would inform you of any news concerning your brother. Whatever lies within the letter cannot be of such an urgent nature. Determined now to complete your task, you make your way towards the post office window. If you hurry, you may be in time for the mail coach that departs at noon. However, you suddenly find yourself colliding with a stranger. <gasps> there he is! <laughs> oh, pardon me. I am terribly sorry, ma'am. Let's see, the fault is not yours alone. As I had been lost in my thoughts, I am equally to blame. You should be more apologetic and less absent-minded. It is no bother, sir, with so many people about collisions are bound to happen. You are too gracious, ma'am. Are you hurt? No, I am not. And you, sir? You are too kind, ma'am, to ask after me after I have caused such an inconvenience. I am unscathed, save my pride. I do not wish to compound my offenses towards such a fair lady as yourself by keeping you from your business. Have a good day, ma'am. Truly, it is no bother at all. Thank you for being so amiable, ma'am. Mm. There's our man. Oh, boy. You arrive at the postal window with enough time to spare. The postal clerk stamps your mother's letter with a pleasant smile, and you are relieved to have, at having completed your task. There is still some time left before you must go home for tea. Should we even bother talking to her? Let's, let's just leave. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! My lovely Miss Sharp, you are as fair today as a field of fair flowers. <laughs> oh yes, thank you. I fear I must leave now. Goodbye! Oh wait, let's pretend that we haven't heard him. Miss Sharp? Oh dear, I do believe I had not spoken loudly enough, and that address did indeed sound a little odd. A fair field of flowers, perhaps? <laughs> Bye. <laughs> you follow the well-worn path with a light spring in your step. While you walk, your footsteps become drowned by another equally familiar sound. You find an unobtrusive spot beside the trail to s and step aside to allow for a horse and its rider to pass. Oh, look, that's that's Catherine's man. We'll let them have their own story. <laughs> the stranger nods at you and thanks and continues on. Elizabeth, where have you been? You have been gone almost half a day, and only to post a letter, no less. Hmm. It has been such a while since I truly took the time to enjoy the fresh air and the company of others that I suppose I got a little carried away. And while you were indulging yourself, I was worrying myself sick. But enough of that prattle. We are expecting guests very shortly, so hurry along, child, and make yourself presentable. Heavens, is that mud on your shoes? Go to Elizabeth. Oh, did you see her hem? Six inches deep in mud. It's positively medieval. It's only a little mud, Mama. Do calm down. Yes, I suppose you're right. But I won't be fully calm until you're more presentable. So hurry along and change your attire. Fine, Mom. How curious. There are certainly a few new faces around Darlington. You managed to catch a glimpse of a handsome stranger in the woods as he passed by, though he seemed to be in haste. You also managed to escape, <laughs> escape Mr. Digby's attentions. It's not that he's particularly disagreeable, but rather his conversation is a little dull. All right. Father's old friends are visiting. Hello, Mr. and Mrs. Worthington. It is so lovely to see you both again. Ah, Mrs. Sharp, it has been far too long. I trust you both found Europe to your liking? Yes, indeed. Mr. Worthington and I spent a great deal of time in Rome, which was much more temperate and most favorable. And you, Mrs. Sharp? I cannot believe the last year has been easy on you with old Sharp's passing. Please accept our late condolences. Mr. Worthington and I are most apologetic for our delayed return. The Europeans are not so efficient with their post, despite the very detailed forwarding instructions we left. It was only two months ago that we finally received your letters. 
Oh, do not continue to trouble yourself with such thoughts. I thank you again for your prompt response and for your hasty return to England. Will you be staying long? Yes, Mr. No, yes, Mrs. Worthington and I are both happy to be home, and this time for good. But alas, Darlington shall never be the same. Sharp was indeed the dearest friend I ever had, and it saddens me deeply that he is no longer with us. But if I have counted correctly, today marks a new start, does it not? I see neither of you are sporting your morning attire. Yes, you are quite right. A year and a day since Mr. Sharp left us. And Miss Sharp, how are you faring? Oh, I'm as well as can be. Truthfully, I have been better, but I suppose I could be worse too. Very wise words, my dear. The loss of a father deals a great blow, from which one cannot fully recover. But take heart, dear Miss Sharp, for Mr. Worthington and I are here for you, should you need our counsel or assistance. Indeed, perhaps I would go further to say that I feel you are in my care now, Miss Sharp. Given your father and I were the closest of friends, almost brothers, I feel I must see to it that you obtain the happiness old Sharp would have wanted for you. I hope I'm not being too forward. Quite the contrary, Mr. Worthington. I am sure Elizabeth is grateful for your concern, as am I. My dear Miss Sharp, I am sure you know that the way to secure happiness is by marrying a kind gentleman with the means to provide for you. Wow, that is apparently the way to secure happiness. <laughs> oh, the Regency era. All right. I do not say this to belittle your intelligence, but to stress the importance of this point. What of love? How highly would you regard that, Mr. Worthington? As much as it pains me to say so, I must confess that although love is preferable, it is not a necessity. Dude. In order to achieve your future happiness, there are certain accomplishments a lady must possess. You are a gentleman's daughter, and you must embody that in every way, be it in your attire, talents, or intellect. You have grown into a handsome young woman, but you must not neglect your skill in the arts in cultivating a fine and sensitive mind. Ah, uh, I do hope she will heed your words, for my daughter has seldom spent any time practicing her skills lately. Do not be so harsh on her, for the poor child has lost a father just as you has lost just as you has lost that nope. Nope. Try again. The poor child has lost a father just as you have lost a husband. I am sure she will change her ways and begin polishing her accomplishments. I believe Miss Sharp understands what she must do. Now, Mrs. Sharp, Mrs. Worthington, and I have decided to host the first dinner upon our return at Castridge Court for a small gathering of my most intimate acquaintances. We would be honored and delighted if you and Miss Sharp could join us. The honor is ours. Thank you, Mr. Worthington, Mrs. Worthington, for your friendship. Think not of it. I'm afraid we must return to Castridge Court now, as there is much to be done after such a long absence. Yes, of course. Thank you ever so much for calling, and for showing such concern for Elizabeth. Not at all. Elizabeth, do remember what I have said. Mr. Worthington is a sensible man and a very old friend of father's. It would be wise to heed his words and work towards becoming the model of an accomplished gentlewoman. Oops, I pressed the wrong one. I forget. Okay, so I need to have needlework at one. So... Uh, sure. Alright. Shopping for the spring ball. I guess this one. Miss Sharp, it is quite a relief to see a familiar face at last. Uh, pretend not to hear and walk on. Miss Sharp? Miss Sharp? Oh, good. For a moment there, I thought you may have troubles with your hearing. But do allow me to share with you my concerns, for they are most dire and unfortunate indeed. And I do not know for how much longer I am to endure such a dreadful thing. Oh, do not look so blank, Miss Sharp, for you must know why I am so unnerved. Oh, I am too far beyond my years for this indeed. <laughs> Wait, you're beginning to make quite a spectacle of yourself, Mrs. Norris. And she goes, <laughs> gasps in horror, then speaks in a quiet voice. Oh my gosh, she goes, <gasps> oh, do pardon me, my dear. Thank you for your discretion. 
It is all this red I am surrounded by. Everywhere I turn, I see red, red, and more red. It is quite atrocious. There is so much red floating about and sometimes lined with gold. And oh, the ruckus that they make. I simply cannot fathom it. Now, dear, I am very much grateful for the militia and their most cherished service to Britain. But must they come to Darlington and destroy our peace? But their livery is quite fetching, do you not, you, do you not think? Fetching? Oh, my poor dear, your thoughts have been contaminated. It is exactly as I had feared. And there's that one soldier who is perpetually about. A Mr. Oh, I have quite forgotten his name. Mr. Gordon? No, that doesn't sound right. Ah, yes, Graham is his name. Wild and irresponsible like the rest of them. And such a distraction for the ladies in town. Nothing like Mr. Digby, who is most dependable and who would never frolic about covered in red. <laughs> Like, oh, goodness me, Miss Sharp. I have just been privy to the most unwelcome image in my mind. I must go seek Mr. Digby immediately, lest he ever don clothing of such a scandalous shade. Bye. Large income. You have picked up Mama's new lace for Mr. Andrew's haberdashery and are ready to head home. As you walk down the street, you hear a commotion outside of Mr. Murray's shop. The shouting is loud and familiar, but and you cannot help but overhear. Oh, it's them again. I forgot about them. <laughs> it is absolutely not your business, Tom. Go back to your whatever it is that you do with your sorry self all day. Now, Phoebe, it is not proper for a gentleman's daughter to raise her voice just as you did. Let us be calm and reasonable. Yes, and I know exactly how to achieve that. Goodbye, Tom. You're not going to leave without showing me that dress. You know you want to dazzle me with your latest commission. That is the very last thing I want to do. I simply wish to go home. Leave me be. Oh, but you were so excited just moments ago when you picked it up from the shop. What has changed? Leave me be. My, my. Let me guess. It can't be that I have ruined your enjoyment by asking to see your dress. Oh, Phoebe, you are much vainer than that. I am not vain. Ordering a new dress just to attend the Earl Woods Spring Ball. That is vanity, my dear. If you must know, everyone in town has been acquiring new clothing for the ball. I suppose an imbecile like you would know nothing of it. Oh, I have my outfit ready. Thank you very much. I didn't know you cared so much for my attire. I do not. Now, for the last time, Thomas Winslow, leave me be. As you wish. I suspect you are ashamed of showing your dress in public. It is bound to be lackluster and outdated. On your way now, Phoebe. Phoebe is visibly upset as she storms off. The small audience that has gathered around the commotion starts to disassemble. You notice Mrs. Norris among the crowd. She is frowning and shaking her head with more severity than usual. She's just over there going... <laughs> okay, let's see. Colonel Brandon was in the army... Alright, what else do we have here? Okay, shoot. <laughs> Wait, what is... No, okay, let's just... Uh, I already did your storyline. Elizabeth, I'm so sorry I've not called on you lately, but it is so good to speak to you alone at last. Let us try not to make a habit of it. Oh my gosh. You are always so perceptive, my dear Elizabeth. Be sh but surely you must know- No, you must have heard about the latest news regarding a certain gentleman. Perhaps Mary has already told you about it. I don't think Mary has mentioned it. At least not to me. Well, I thought you might have noticed Mr. Brown has been in town. This is very much news to me. Mr. Brown has been- has long been a family friend. He and Papa rather enjoy playing chess together. Mr. Brown is gracious enough to- Ah, uh, have us at Norwich for a few months, during which I made his better acquaintance. Since our return to Darlington, Mr. Brown has been making his visits rather frequent. He and Papa still quite... still spend quite some time playing chess, but I'm starting to wonder about his intentions. Mr. Brown has set his sights on you. Elizabeth, you cannot be so sure. But in any case, Mama hasn't been encouraging me to, well, encourage Mr. Brown. I am not quite sure if that would be the correct thing to do. Do 
Do you think it would be dishonest to encourage him? I suppose so. I do not wish to make any assumptions, but if he does prove to be a suitor, well, I would be quite flattered. Mr. Brown is a good man, and is very calm and respectable. Hmm. There are much worse fates than to become the wife of such a man. Oh, how I would very much like to be married to a sensible man, raise sensible children, and have a sensible life. That's all I have ever wanted. Hmm. Do not sound so sad, dear Phoebe. If Mr. Brown does indeed have his sights set on you, then your wishes might soon come true. Yes, you are right. You and Phoebe share some other news for the remainder of her visit, though she appears to be somewhat distracted. These are all written by men. All right. All right, I've got so many points. Okay. everything to four. All right, so let's see. A handsome gentleman is enamored with you. He has asked you to stand up and dance with him for the third time that night. You should not refuse him as he is paying you a great compliment. Oh, I don't know. True? Nope. I knew it was false. Oh, man. Okay. Rude jokes at dinner. Oh, my goodness. Just smile and change the topic. My sister had a um, Regency-themed murder mystery party once, and every time something scandalous was said, like, every woman in the room, like, fanned themselves. <laughs> you have entered Mr. Worthington's home for the first time. You are impressed by its stateliness. Mr. Curtis, I have not seen you all evening, and have begun to wonder if you had come at all. Now I know there are unfamiliar faces, but there's no need to keep entirely to yourself. Surely my preference for solitude is not causing anyone harm. Ah, uh, but the ladies will grieve for your presence. Ladies with whom I am not acquainted, I can see they're simply overcome with melancholy. Ah, oh, I've missed your cutting remarks, my friend. But I suppose you wish to make an introduction. I shall allow it if the lady permits. I have no objections. I do have a few objections. Well, Mr. Curtis, this is Miss Elizabeth Sharp, the only daughter of my late friend. Miss Sharp, I know Mr. Curtis from my years at Oxford. How do you do, Miss Sharp? I'm quite sure you shall find you have much in common. Indeed. Now, Curtis, don't look so glum, lest you frighten poor Miss Sharp. But you must excuse me, as I believe I see Mr. and Mrs. Reed, and I'm sure you know the magnitude of Mr. Reed's patience. Miss Sharp, I suppose I am expected to inquire about as to your current state of being. Uh, I suppose I shall admit to having been standing all evening, and I am beginning to tire. Shall I fetch you a chair or a carriage, or would you rather prefer to succumb to a well-orchestrated swoon? <laughs> uh, okay. I'm afraid a simple chair will not suffice, Mr. Curtis. I shall require an entire couch upon which to retire. In the middle of the ballroom? Not the most considerate, but admittedly the most effective in garnering attention. <laughs> On another note, I believe I should mention that Mr. Worthington has indicated you have a fondness for reading. Indeed. I find that lately I'm spending a considerable amount of time ensconced in a chair with a book in my lap. Hee <laughs> hee! Okay, whatever. An excellent way to spend an afternoon. As delightful as our conversation has been, I believe our host is about to announce dinner. Perhaps we may converse further at a later time. Indeed, we may. After dinner. Miss Sharp, I trust you enjoyed your meal? It was as expected. A meal is, after all, simply a meal. Very much so. I have not dined with Mr. Worthington in recent memory, but this evening has exceeded my expectations. You have a pensive look about you. May I inquire as to your thoughts? Uh... 
There is much about which to be pensive. Whom should one approach? What should one say? Whether one should brave a glass of port or settle with the punch? Alas, your demeanor lacks the predatory glint that accompanies the thoughts of one's choosing their target. Whether it be a portly gentleman, or perhaps more simply, port. Indeed, my mind has strayed to a book. If you must know, my mind has strayed to a few trifling books. Oh. So, literally the same option. We'll talk about Shakespeare. <laughs> I dare say the sonnets are rather wonderful creations. I remember reading them in my youth, though I now feel compelled to revisit them. Do you favor any particular piece? Hmm. Let's be basic. Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Ah, the timeless beauty that has cap been captured in poetry, when in eternal lines that to time thou growest, simply exquisite. The entire piece is very lovely. Alright, I'm quite quite partial to the last line. So long lives this and gives life to thee. It is such a simple statement, yet so profound. And as enduring as Master Shakespeare predicted. Have you been acquainted with Sonnet 53? It is a poem that has remained with me throughout these years. I may have come across it in my perusal of the sonnets, but I am afraid I do not have any recollections of that particular piece. If you hold it in such high esteem, then I shall revisit my book and look for it. Ugh. Alright. Um, I have not, and I do not have any particular wish to revisit the sonnets at the present, perhaps some other time. That is quite the shame. If, however, you do feel so inclined to revisit the sonnet, I believe there is much we can discuss. Awesome. So, I just had to, like stop being interested in books in order to get him to stop talking to us. <laughs> All right. to avoid her. Oops. <laughs> I did not mean to press that. <laughs> okay. I guess we'll go walking in the woods. You are walking through the woods when you hear a pair of raised voices. As you approach the bickering couple, you recognize them as Phoebe and Tom. These people! Can I not get away from these people? They appear to be heading in the same direction as you, and have seemed to master the art of arguing while walking. Stop this at once. I am not a young girl you can so easily scare. Oh, but the hermit in the woods does not discriminate between young girls and young ladies. He would happily make either his prisoner. Don't be ludicrous. There are no hermits living in these woods, or elsewhere in Darlington for that matter. And today we bid farewell to Miss Phoebe, Phoebe, <laughs> Phoebe Ingram, who, after having lived all of one and twenty years, met her ultimate ends at the hands of the woodland hermit. Thomas Winslow, have you no sense of propriety? Indeed I do. It would be a travesty should such an unhappy end befall the innocent Miss Ingram. We have come here today to remember before God our sister Phoebe, to give thanks for her life, to commend her to God for our, our merciful redeemer and judge. Hey, stop! Hey, cats! Hey! Sorry. My one cat was, like, fighting my other cat. <sighs> to commend her body to be buried in and converted under her grief. She's visibly upset. Poor Phoebe, you need not be so afraid. I will become your knight, your champion, and protect you from the evils of the woodland hermit. Of course, taking on such a responsibility is quite the hassle, especially when you are to be my charge. But I shall bear the burden at all costs. Miss Ingram must be saved. You may speak up, my dear. You are quite safe, now that I will accompany you on your walks forevermore. You, Mr. Winslow, are a complete and utter cad. I would rather be kidnapped by the hermit than have you for company. Ah, so you admit that the hermit does indeed exist. I have tolerated you enough for the day. I demand you leave my presence, Mr. Winslow. Is that how you propose to address the hermit when he launches his attack? I demand you leave my presence, Mr. Hermit. I am quite serious, Tom. I neither want nor require your company. Oh, but we have almost reached town. It appears I have successfully completed my inaugural task as your champion. 
Phoebe and Tom part ways once they are in town, but Phoebe pays no heed to Tom while he bids her a lavish farewell. I think we're going to break them up in this game. May as well, right? I have no idea. Okay. Hold on. One second. Alright, just checking on the kitty cat. Okay, so Elizabeth, Mrs. Norris has just bought some brought some rather puzzling news. I'm not quite sure what to make of it. And not you know you paid so much heed to Mrs. Norris's gossip. She may be a gossip, but her information is surprisingly accurate and should not be discounted. Word has it that Tom Winslow has returned from London with a sizable collection of ladies' hats in all the latest fashions, but he would not reveal his intended recipient. Perhaps he means to wear them himself at the next ball. <laughs> Elizabeth, some things are too disgraceful for jesting. It appears that Mrs. Norris was there to witness yet another altercation between the two in town earlier this morning. Phoebe, the poor dear, simply wanted to discover the recipient, as we all did. Hers was a polite question, but Tom turned it into quite a public scene. He accused her of prying, and when she began to defend herself, he simply would not relent. After quite a row, Tom declared that Phoebe Ingram is a busybody who had no business in his affairs, and who would be the last person to ever find out about his, the intended recipient of his hats. But I do wish he would tell the rest of us. If Tom Winslow is interested in courting someone, he should not be so selfish in keeping it to himself. Mama, Tom has every right to the privacy he seeks in these affairs. Nonsense. His business belongs not to him but alone, but to all of Darlington. <laughs> what? Tom Winslow is and his mysterious hats. Well, that makes me wonder if you will ever be courted with hats. No, no, I do not care about hats. Just a husband would do. Uh, yes, Mama, I will be doing my I will do my best to secure myself a happy marriage. Well, it seems you need to be doing a bit better than your best. Enough of this idle talk. Why are you not practicing your accomplishments? Go and refine your skills before you find yourself an old maid. Man, everybody's so mean. Okay. What can I do? Uh, nope. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, that's the same one I picked last time. Okay, go to the library. You are browsing through the latest additions to Mr. Chappelle's lending library when Mrs. Norris approaches you. Her again. Miss Sharp, I have with me the latest news about Mr. Winslow and Miss Ingram and all the ruckus they've been causing in Darlington. If only I had known Mr. Winslow would become such a loud, undignified young man. I would have stepped in during his childhood, you know. I kept telling Mrs. Winslow she ought to be more strict with her son, but that woman kept insisting I mind my own business. Which I thought was a great affront. Everything that happens in Darlington affects me directly, if I may say so myself. Just look at me now, being so distressed after yet another public display by Mr. Winslow and Miss Ingram. I am quite unhappy with their constant disruption of the general peace. Though, I suppose they do provide a good example on how not to behave. I hope you're paying close attention, Miss Sharp, for I rarely dispense my wisdom so freely. Well, so, this, oops, this latest transgression, Mr. Winslow was declaring rather loudly, I might add, that he has commissioned an order of no less than half a dozen dresses from Mr. Murray, all in the latest fashion with the finest fabrics. He was, of course, declaring this to Miss Ingram, who said all sorts of unsavory things to Mr. Winslow, which I shan't repeat here. Now, I agree with Miss Ingram's sentiments. After all, Mr. Winslow deserves to be reprimanded. But she should not have been so brazen in her disapproval, as she only succeeded in making him laugh even more while he continued with his taunts in an utterly despicable manner. Oh, Miss Sharp, if only you knew what I suffer! They are both guilty of behaving in a shameful way and of ruining my enjoyment of the day. Why must the young men of Darlington cause such scandal? Why can't they be more like Mr. Digby? 
Now, Mr. Digby, as you know, possesses all the qualities of a good and virtuous gentleman. He would never call he would have never caused such a scene, or squander away such a large amount of money on the few freely gowns. Yes, Mr. Winslow would no, yes, would benefit greatly from spending some time with Mr. Digby, and learn from his superior example. Yes, yes, I must see to such an arrangement. Oh my gosh. There we go. Got it. All right. Du, 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 du. Lord Fat Cat. Okay. Sorry, some of these things are just like, it's impossible for it to be different, so I want to not dwell on the things that are the exact same as last time, so that you guys don't get bored. There we go. are doing great, but I'm not finding a lot of uh, opportunity to to see, what's his name? Mr. Graham. Or I'm not finding any opportunity. So, I guess they're making me do the Tom and Phoebe uh, storyline. So, alright, you walk by Mr. Winslow and Mr. Digby who are deep in conversation. I have always admired your enthusiasm, Mr. Winslow, but a happy marriage must be respectable above all else. No, no, that would not do. If a marriage were only respectable, then it would be such a bore, and so without meaning. But it is not for us to concern ourselves with what might be boring. As husbands and as gentlemen, we must perform our duties in providing for our wife and children. Yes, well, duty is all well enough, but I tell you, there must be something more in a marriage. A spark, a fire, a meeting of minds, a collision of temper and vivacity. And your chosen wife, well, hold, hold on. The cat's knocked a lamp over. I don't know. Okay, whatever. Anyway. Oh, okay. And your chosen wife, well, she must be the one who can inspire such passions. She must be moved in your presence and you in hers. A faraway look takes over Tom's expression as he becomes rather quiet and content. Mr. Digby, on the other hand, appears to be a great deal more confused than before. Oh, Phoebe, I do and love the embroidered additions you've made to your dress. You must teach me how to achieve such an effect. Dearest Mary, you forgot I've shown it to you many times. There is only so much an instructor can do when the pupil is unwilling to practice. But needlework can be so tedious. Uh, it seems we may have company. Mary, Elizabeth, you both look splendid this evening. I have never come across any ladies who are more dazzling than you two. Always the flatterer, Tom. Yeah, but I hear no objection from you. True. And you, you would not object. Might I have the pleasure of standing next to, with you for the, no standing with you for the next two dances? Certainly you may, so long as you promise not to embarrass me in front of all our friends. It seems my transgressions as a boy of twelve will remain with me evermore. Though I must remind you that the dancing master praised your ability to continue your steps despite my blundering. Now, Tom, do not try to take credit for my accomplishments. I wouldn't think of it. And you, Elizabeth, would you oblige me with a dance or two? 
Before you can answer, Phoebe interrupts your conversation. Marry this Elizabeth Thad. What if, Phoebe? I've known you... I've long known you've lost your mind, or perhaps you never had any to begin with, but now your manners have fallen beyond reprieve. Oh, Miss Phoebe, I had thought you were part of the decor. I did not recognize you. Ah, uh, but there's your customary scowl. Yes, I see you now. You are simply despicable. And I suppose you wish to dance with my despicable self? Absolutely not. You, sir, are a cat of the highest order, and I do not wish to dance with someone as rude as awful as you. My, my, you're starting to sound like an old jealous crow with far too many empty spaces on her dance card. Perhaps you should go play cards with the spinsters, for that's what you'll become. You, you! Baby turns and walks away, but not before you see tears slipping down her cheeks. We all understand the occasional jesting, but why must you sometimes go beyond what's acceptable? Honestly, Tom, perhaps you need to remind yourself you are no longer a boy of twelve. <sighs> well, that could have gone better. Mary and Phoebe are both right. You really ought to mind your manners. We have always loved your boisterous personality, but now, now you are simply callous. What do you suppose I should do? Hmm. Perhaps you should do nothing and hope she will forget about your unkindness soon enough. <laughs> yeah, I want to break them off in this one, so let's see what happens. Indeed, and it seems my inclination to dance has been lost, and only to be replaced by a sudden thirst. To the drink's table I shall go. Okay. You know what? Let's make all the points. Okay. Okay, I guess I need to do this. Dear Elizabeth, I have such news. Oh, you must have heard by now. But oh, I simply don't know what to think. I hope whatever news you are about to reveal does indeed warrant your reaction. Is there news about whom and what? Oh, Mary, I have not yet heard. You must tell me. It's about Tom's proposal of Phoebe. Good lord! Oh, Elizabeth, I never thought such a day would come. At long last, I was afraid I'd become an old maid by the time it happens. Tom has proposed, oh, that is news indeed. She refused him. I've yet to discover the manner of his proposal or of her refusal, but I suspect it had something to do with how Tom has been treating our Phoebe and how she might be considering Mr. Brown as a possible husband. But in any case, poor Phoebe was in quite a state and poor Tom to be refused. I confess I'm not as shocked as you. Mr. Brown would be a far more suitable match and dear Phoebe would be a great deal happier with him than with Tom. I think we should call on them to ensure they are not too distressed. I will go see Tom, for I fear he is in low spirits. Would you go see Phoebe? Yes, of course. I care for her dearly and only wish her the very best. I know you are good friends with Tom, but I suspect he would benefit from my uncouth jests and frank statements at present. And I think Phoebe would much prefer a visit from you. Yes, I see. I will go call on Phoebe then. It is settled. Oh, I do hope there will be a happy resolution, whatever that might entail. Okay. Whatever. Let's get this done. Break them up. Comforting a friend. You wish to comfort Phoebe, blah blah blah. Okay. Phoebe greets you with a silent nod. Her eyes weary, her shoulders slouched. Her face is a little sallow, and it appears it has been some time since she had some proper rest. Should we take her hand? Oh goodness, she's crying. Reassure her. Eventually, Phoebe's sobs recede, though her face is still wet with tears. She dabs at it with a handkerchief. I never thought Tom would propose marriage to me, and yet, when he called on me and asked me for his hand, I don't think he even asked Papa for consent. It is just like Tom to be so brash and uncouth in his actions. I agree with you wholeheartedly. He must remember that although we did grow up together, we are no longer children. But an offer of marriage, Elizabeth, surely he must be jesting. Do you stand by your refusal? Oh, I don't... Oh, I don't know, Elizabeth. And there's Mr. Brown. Oh, Elizabeth, Mama, and Papa are both certain he'll make an offer to me. He is quite lovely, really, and dependable and respectable. Mr. Brown would be a very good husband, and I have no doubt we could live a moderately comfortable life. Yeah, I agree with you, Phoebe. 
I quite agree with you, Phoebe. Tom is a good friend, but he would not be a good husband for you. You would be much happier with Mr. Brown. Yes, you are. Wait, da, da. Yes, you are quite right. I believe I will find my happiness with Mr. Brown. I shall put Tom behind me. Thank you for your counsel, Elizabeth. I am truly grateful for your friendship. But I require some time alone to, with my thoughts. Thank you again, Elizabeth. You leave Phoebe and to her thoughts and start to make your way home. You have not walked for long when you encounter Tom, who appears to be heading toward the Ingram's residence. Tom's appearance leaves a lot to be desired. You suspect he has not slept since you saw him last. Elizabeth, are you well? A lot better than you, it seems. I hope you're not planning to call on Phoebe while you're in such a hard state. Have you gone to see Phoebe? How has she been faring? You are the last person who is entitled to ask such a thing, seeing as you are the cause of her distress. I am duly reprimanded. Elizabeth, please believe me. I was sincere in my proposal. I know I've not been the most well-behaved where Phoebe is concerned, but she is very dear to me. If that is the case, then perhaps you should leave her be. Phoebe would be much better off without you and your constant provocations. I have been such a fool. Tom remains standing and looks forlornly in the direction of Phoebe's house. He ignores your presence and clearly wishes to be left alone. I don't... Hold on. We all have a better guide in if we would attend to it than... Okay... What is this word? Oh, it's ourselves. <laughs> okay. So, Mama has news. Oh, Elizabeth, I happened to cross Mrs. Norris in the town this morning, and she has given me the most extraordinary news. Do you remember all the hats and dresses Tom Winslow had purchased? Yes, of course he'd gone on about them, so. It so happens that Tom Winslow had intended them for dear Phoebe, only he had not known when or how to make a gift of them. And now our dear Phoebe has been equipped with a new wardrobe. Oh, wow, wait. <laughs> but alas, Phoebe was not to be persuaded by such a display. She refused poor Tom for the second time and informed him of a recent engagement to Mr. Brown. Okay. I think she has made a wise choice. Mr. Brown will surely treat her well and give Phoebe the peace and contentment she desires. Yes, I agree with you there, Elizabeth. Of course, Mrs. Norris was pleased to hear such news. She couldn't stand the thought of the havoc and scandal the pair might continue to cause in Darlington. Who knows, perhaps Tom will now set his sights on one of his other childhood friends. Mary might become his next target. Perhaps she will. Now, Elizabeth, with one of your friends securing matrimony, it is even more important for you to practice your accomplishments. Who knows when, who, whom you might meet at the nuptials. got through that storyline way faster this time. Ah, Elizabeth, you look tremendously well. There seems to be a certain flourish in your cheeks since I saw you last. My dear Mary, you are being too kind. You look rather well yourself. I trust your family as well. They are indeed. Now, do you know Lambton Hall? I think the Hudsons occupied it for a while, though it's been empty since they left two years ago. I'm not quite sure which cottage you're talking about. I'm afraid I don't recall any Hudson, so you might have to refresh my memory. I think he used to be owned by Mrs. Norris's cousin, Mr. Hudson, for when he visited the country. Mama said it is a big courtyard and no less than 30 rooms. I suppose the exact details are secondary. Mama heard from Mrs. Norris this morning that the hall has been sold and the new proprietor intends to open up a school for anyone who wishes to receive an education. What a strange thing to do. What a peculiar endeavor. Let it never be said that such fascinating events do not occur in Darlington. 
I somehow feel that this discovery is the least of it. I wonder if the proprietor is anyone we know. I think Mama will make some inquiries, and if uh, she does not, then I'm sure Mrs. Norris certainly will. Well, that is the only news I bring you. Now, do you remember how we last spoke about the benefits of changing the upholstery for the next season? You and Mary continue to drink your tea and speak for a fair while longer. Points. All right. On your way into town, you see two familiar figures encountering each other unexpectedly. However, instead of the loud bickering that has become so strongly associated with this particular couple, they utter no sound and are simply regarding each other in silence. They stand quite a fair way apart from each other, stretching out the distance between them. After several long moments, Tom turns and walks turns around and walks in the opposite direction. Hold on. Sorry, cat. Goodness, he's Kitty cats are ridiculous today. His shoulders are sagged and every step appears to require effort. Phoebe watches him leave, her own eyes sad and dull. Never have you seen your friend so utterly alone and desolate. Uh, we should leave her be. She lingers long after he has disappeared from sight before continuing on her walk and going about her own business. Wait, what happens if we make her presence known? Oh, Lord Fat Cat stops us. Oh my goodness. When can I see Mr. Graham? I have no idea how much muslin is. I have no idea. Okay. Um Okay. Nope. All right. Let's go visit the Earlwoods. Mr. and Mrs. Earlwood have invited you and Mama to tea. If the weather is agreeable, there may be a chance of taking a carriage with the Earlwood girls to a nearby park where you hope to feed some ducks. Hmm. Mrs. and Miss Sharp. Miss Miss Sharp. Mrs. and Miss Miss Sharp. It is so kind of you to join us at last. I apologize, Mrs. Norris. I hope... Whoops. I hope you have not had to exert yourself to entertain our hosts in our absence. I know how conversing can be so tiring for you. Sure. Not at all. When you have had as many years of experience in this world as I certainly behold, the art of conversation becomes less a chore and more of an indulgence. And if you, my dear, ever find yourself struggling with making topical remarks, I will happily instruct you on the matter. It must be such an inconvenience if you found it taxing to speak to our hosts, or anyone else in Darlington for that matter. Mrs. Norris, you're very kind to offer your wisdom, but perhaps on a rainy day when there is not so much outside to see? I know you, Mama, and Mrs. Sharp wish to remain here, but the girls and I are eager to take some fresh air. Why, Miss Earlwood, you are perhaps a little too hasty, although I suppose that is one of the merits and indulgences of youth, one of which I rather disapprove. Do you not agree, Miss Sharp? I dare say I must side with Mary on this account. It is a rather beautiful day, after all, and it would be a shame to waste it. Well, I suppose if you are so eager to indulge in passing delights, then who am I to show my disapproval? Well, Mrs. Norris, I agree with Mary. Today is perfect for picking flowers. And feeding ducks. And feeding ducks! Please, Mrs. Norris, now that Elizabeth has finally arrived, we may we go find flowers and ducks. Mrs. Norris should... Norris? Mrs. Norris, surely you would agree that the hastiness of mere children does not follow the same principles as that of the more mature youth... I would not necessarily concede, for it is of my firmest belief that, please, Mrs. Norris, I'll save the prettiest flowers for you. Before Mrs. Norris has a chance to respond or to declare what constitutes her firmest beliefs, Anna enters the room, appearing rather upset. Mr. Earlwood, Matthew has fallen while retrieving Lord Fat Cat from the apple tree. Matthew has hurt his leg. That is terrible news indeed. Anna, send for a physician. Yes, sir. Oh dear, I suppose this is impinged on your plans, dear Lettuce. With Matthew Heard, there is no chance of taking the carriage now. 
but it's been raining for weeks and it's finally stopped and it's become beautiful again. Hush, let us. Let us obeys, but her eyes are bright with tears. If it is not too insolent of me, Mrs. Earlwood, I think I would like to join the ladies for some fresh air. Mr. Digby, you are far too kind, but your offer is unnecessary. No, not at all. Mr. Digby clears his throat, presumably a little embarrassed for having interrupted his hostess. I suppose I could manage an open carriage. Are you certain you would not mind? Do not mind poor Lettuce, for she will recover soon enough. Lettuce bravely blinks away her tears. On the contrary, it would be a pleasure to be of service. I would very much like to take Miss Sharp and her friends someplace to pick ducks and feed flowers. <laughs> um, okay. Lettuce lets out a little giggle, though you are not entirely certain whether Mr. Digby's humor was intended. <laughs> Elizabeth, would you trouble Mr. Digby with such a task? If Mr. Digby insists so strongly, then I doubt it would trouble him at all. I would be content either way, but I do not wish to deprive Lettuce of her outing. I believe Mr. Digby feels the same. Miss Sharp is quite right. With your permission, Mrs. Earlwood. At Mrs. Earlwood's nod of assent, Lettuce lets out a squeal of delight. Mr. Digby, however, appears increasingly disconcerted. You, Mary, Harriet, and Lettuce have settled in the Earlwood's open carriage. Mr. Digby takes his place at the driver's seat, and you can see the back of his head. <laughs> right. Very well. Yes, indeed. Mr. Digby seems to be muttering to himself. Mary begins to make unladylike faces, causing Harriet to smile and Lettuce to giggle. Are you all comfortable? Yes, Mr. Digby, though I suppose Lettuce is getting a little impatient. Yes, yes, very well, indeed. You hear a crack of a whip. Nothing happens. The whip cracks again. You notice something strange about the sound, as as if it has been struck incorrectly. Still, nothing happens. Mr. Digby is speaking again, albeit in a rather peculiar voice. You manage to catch snippets of his words, and realize he is pleading with the horses. Mr. Digby, we are quite ready to leave now. Yes, of course, Mr. Elwood. There's another loud crack immediately, followed by a pained cry. You jump in alarm. Is everything all right, Mr. Digby? Is everything all right, Mr. Digby? <laughs> Light the carriage to investigate. There is another cry, this time closer to a whimper, and you see Mr. Digby tumble from his seat. He is clutching his left arm. I suppose Matthew is not the only rider who has been injured today. That is unfair to poor Matthew, who at least knows how to ride. Miss Sharp, he uncovers his arm and pales at the sight. You should not have been so hasty to volunteer yourself in something at which you are clearly inept, Mr. Digby. The girls and I will find Mama and Papa. She runs into the house, Harriet and Lettuce on her heels leaving you with Mr. Digby. <laughs> Just gonna wait. Mr. Digby begins to mumble unintelligibly. Mary returns with Mr. Earlwood and the entourage of servants. They hoist up Mr. Digby, who, despite being on the verge of losing consciousness, <laughs> insists on pausing to admire the clouds. You follow the group inside, knowing that the day, despite its perfect weather, can no longer be salvaged. Oh my gosh, Mr. Digby. Wait, I have so many points left. Okay. Okay, am I just never going to see Mr. Graham again? Wait. Why, Miss Sharp, you are about. Oh, I have heard such distressing news, and I much, must share them with you immediately. I do not have time to speak, Mrs. Norris. Oh, but you must hear me out, and I shan't take too long. But oh, how it must be relayed to you. My dear cousin, Mr. Hudson, once occupied Lambton Hall. Are you familiar with it? Surely you must be. I believe we all visited at some point, though perhaps you were too young to remember the excursion. Now, Mr. Hudson has relocated his family to London, though I do not know why. It's such a dreadfully loud and nasty place, with the most unkempt folks everywhere. Oh, I do not know what he is thinking, my foolish cousin. Perhaps you were not suited to London, but it is all not... Not all altogether bad. Whatever. 
Uh, yes, of course you would say that, youngsters. I'll have a taste for all sorts of dreadful things. Though I must let you now know, Miss Sharp, that I highly disapprove. But enough of London. What I find even more distressing, though the thought of poor Mr. Hudson in London is quite comparable, is the news of Lambton Hall being lately purchased to be turned into a school. Oh, Miss Sharp, are we to disregard all niceties of polite society? Because this school, oh, I almost do not wish to voice it, lest my utterance become a prophecy, is to be for all manner of children, regardless of parentage. To think that those children will be spending their time in schoolrooms rather than learning to plow fields and churn butter? I fear what will become of us all if farmers and laborers learn how to read and think. Oh my gosh. We will all be more civil and learned as a favorable result, do you think? Heavens no, not at all. What a hideous idea is to have gotten into your head, child. Oh, I must leave you lest you contaminate me. Contaminate me. I'm avoiding Ellie at all costs. Gross. All right. Um, so I'm having a thought. Okay. Um, okay, so I have his storyline. Where is it? <laughs> okay, so like, no. Do I just have to, have to keep going? I didn't realize I had so many points, goodness. Oh boy. <sighs> Mr. Digby. My, it is refreshing to be in the true countryside at last. Harriet and Lettuce would be sorry to have missed it. I'm sure the girls would fare well without you, my dear. Anna would surely keep them entertained. Oh, it is not the girls for whom I am concerned, but poor Anna. Perhaps the state of the drawing room, too. Perhaps some discipline might be in order, Mrs. Earlwood. I do remember that when I was a young girl, oh, such a long while ago, I hardly think you would remember it, if you had ever even been birthed into this tremendous world. My mother was so very stern with me that I dared not transgress from her biddings even if I had wished it, which I did not. Of course, I was delightfully obedient, as I had often been praised. Even from the cradle, Mrs. Norris, I find that a little difficult to believe. Why, yes, of course, I was a most pleasant child. I never caused a fuss. Perhaps your incredulity stems from a contradictory experience in your own childhood, Mrs. Sharp. Ah, uh, but my childhood was happy and fulfilling one. As it tends to be when one does not waste her youth on needless preoccupations of propriety. There is hardly need to learn etiquette before one learns how to walk. I suppose grace and wisdom are simply ingrained in those who are fortunate enough to possess such a sense, my dear. And this is precisely the type of tedium Harriet and Liz had wanted to avoid. It is such a shame that I can no longer claim san sanctuary in the nursery. Ah, but there is amusements to be found in these exchanges. I suppose so. The girls are likely to be playing with dolls anyway. Why, Mrs. Norris, Mrs. Sharp, you are both magnificent specimens of ladies, most spectacular and most graceful. Do you not think so, Miss Sharp? Oh my goodness. Yes, of course. Ah, yes. I commend your efforts, Mr. Digby, but sometimes it is better to retreat quietly when the ladies are set on a battle. Say, shall we remove ourselves to the archery targets? Oh, well, yes. Let us remove ourselves at once. Come, Mary, let us make a team. Miss Sharp, I suppose you'll be joining us? Of course you will, Elizabeth. It's Papa and I against you and Mr. Digby. May the, mess, may the best archers win. Oh gosh, I know who's winning. Not me. Mr. Digby is not going to be good at this. Miss Sharp, would you do me the honor of making the first shot? I mean, it sounds rather ominous. I would love to be provided you were the target. <laughs> Elizabeth, I hope you're ready to face your defeat. We shall see about that, Mary. You find the right amount of tension in your bow before releasing. The arrow makes a soft whistle through the air and lodges into one of the inner rings. Mary's shot was not as good as yours and had barely hit the target. 
Very well done, Elizabeth. I had forgotten how adept you are with this fort. Miss Sharp, you are marvelous. It is now Mr. Digby's turn to, to handle his bow. He fumbles with it, bespeaking a lack of familiarity. Oh, no. Would you like some assistance, Mr. Digby? Mr. Digby turns abruptly as your question and knocks your side with his bow. Miss Sharp, I am so terribly... Terrible? <laughs> I... Yes, you are correct. Miss Sharp, Mr. Digby, are you hurt? Goodness, I think you both should sit down for a while. And there goes the entire reason I even bothered coming. But alas, I believe we have escaped, we have escaped Mr. Digby for the time being. <laughs> Cheer up, Mary. At least you're no longer in any danger of losing to me, again. Yeah, I suppose you're right. Yes, let's call this a draw. As you and Mary turn to face the concern of your mothers and Mrs. Norris, you notice Mr. Digby's hunched shoulders, his arms limp to his side, his hands trembling. This poor man. Miss, Miss Sharp. <laughs> what is it now? I am she. I wish to apologize for my earlier clumsiness. I hope you are neither hurt nor offended. You should be concerned for yourself, Mr. Digby. You're quite an embarrassment. Your assessment is very much correct, Miss Sharp. If there is anything in my power to make you more comfortable. You've done quite enough already, Mr. Digby. I do hope you'll accept my sincerest apology, Miss Sharp. Mr. Digby leaves you in peace, though he appears more distressed than ever. While the rest of your party is merrily engaging in a heated discussion about the merits of nurses, Mary seizes the chance to take you aside out of earshot. I noticed Mr. Digby was monopolizing your attention earlier. Poor Elizabeth, you must have been so very bored. If only you knew the pains I suffer. Oh, Mary, do promise you will rescue me in the future. But it is most amusing to watch your interactions. Mr. Digby is such a dreadful bore. I shudder at the thought of conversing with him. Have you ever heard of him speak of anything other than the weather and someone's health? He also compliments me a fair deal, or at least he makes the attempt. Hmm. And how very dire those attempts are. Oh, Mrs. Norris has noticed our absence. I would very much like it if she could keep out of others' business just the once. Here she comes. Girls, may I be privy to your conversation? Why, of course, Mrs. Norris. We were simply discussing the weather. And your health, too. I trust you are well. Mary gives you a cheeky grin, and thankfully, it is the one thing that manages to slip Mrs. Norris's notice. Okay. Oops. I pressed the wrong one. Oh, dear Elizabeth, it is good to see you at last, for I've been wanting to speak to you since yesterday morning. Do you remember when I told you that Lambton Hall is being turned into a school? Yes, what of it? Have you more news? Mrs. Norris has very kindly informed Mama yesterday that she's been making inquiries about the new owner, the owner and whether or not he intends to take residence with his students. It happens that all her inquiries have been for naught, for the benefactor re wishes to remain anonymous. Anonymous? Whatever for. There's no need for secrecy in Darlington. We are few enough and happy enough, or I'd like to think. But to think of how utterly scandalous it would be should we find out the identity of this proprietor. No one knows what kind of school he wishes to build, but it will certainly be large given the size of Lambton Hall. Mama is rather shocked to think that a gentleman in our midst would want to provide an education for anyone who wishes it and bear all expenses himself. I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with such an endeavor. The years bring many changes, and there's no this is no different. Oh, Elizabeth, you never cease to surprise me. I do so enjoy our talks, my dear friend. It is such a strange notion, though, that such a school will be open will soon be open in our vicinity. I will surely let you know if there's any more news. Now, I believe you wanted to ask about the gardenias we keep. They can be rather difficult to cultivate. Mary becomes rather animated, though at times frustrated as she describes her latest horticultural adventures. Oh, you pierce my soul. I am half agony, half hope. Tell me not that I am too late. That such precious feelings are gone forever. Hmm. 
wasn't she just here for tea? My dear Elizabeth, I, I happened to be passing through Lambton Hall last week, and I confess I succumbed to my curiosity and visited the school. Is that so? What transpired thereafter? Upon arriving, I was greeted by the housekeeper, who was wholly courteous and accommodating. I gave her my name and was then introduced to Mr. Simmons, who gave me a tour of the school. I confess I had expected to meet a group of common and ill-behaved children, but to my surprise, all the pupils were both keen and pleasant. They were modestly dressed and shared rooms in the house. But my greatest astonishment was at their enthusiasm during their lessons, which the Mr. Simmons allowed me to observe. The children are just learning how to write, and I believe they will make good progress, as their tutor has an excellent hand. I dare say you seem quite taken with Mr. Simmons. Oh, Elizabeth. But I do not know what to make of the school. Mama has scold, scolded me for calling on such a place, but surely she should have seen it for herself first. It really is quite lovely. How I wish I can accompany you on your next visit. I would certainly like to see the school for myself. Oh yes, Elizabeth, let's. It is quite a shame that we do not know the identity of the proprietor. I would very much like to take tea with him and inquire about his school. But let us speak of that another day. I did notice upon entering this room that you've done some something to the curtains. I'm quite fond of the improvement, dear Elizabeth. Avoiding Ellie, avoiding Mr. Curtis. Oops, one left. All right, a visit to Lambton Hall. Mary has convinced you to accompany her to visit Lambton Hall, a new school with their mysterious proprietor. I don't think we did this in the last game. You arrive at Lambton Hall with Mary, and you vaguely recall being here in your childhood. However, the building in your memories was much more decrepit than it is now. Oh, dear Elizabeth, I am so pleased you have decided to visit with me today. I assure you the children are most civilized, and Mr. Simmons is very accommodating and welcoming. Are you sure we won't be interrupting the lessons? Mary, you really seem to have taken a liking to this Mr. Simmons of yours. Do not tease me so. A stern woman in modest attire greets you both and introduces herself as the housekeeper. Mary gives you your names and you are both led inside. The interiors look surprisingly comfortable and are well insulated. The draperies appear to be new and are quite tastefully decorated. Cute. The classroom is currently occupied by three children, as well as a young man who is presumably Mr. Simmons. Mary gives a brisk knock before entering. Mr. Simmons, I hope we have not come at a bad time. Oh, Miss Earlwood. No, not a bad time at all. Wow, look at him. There is a small moment of silence between Mary and Mr. Simmons before one of the child picks up. Miss Earlwood, you have returned as promised, and we have been practicing our times tables as promised. Oh, Peter, you are so good to have remembered. Do you mean to say that you are ready to be questioned today? Yes, Miss Earlwood, we are, we are. But first, you must be introduced to a very special lady. Mary looks aside at Mr. Simmons, as if asking for permission. The man nods, a small smile on his lips. Ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to present the incomparable Miss Sharp, who, might I say, mastered her times tables before I could get through half of them. Ah, oh, but if you all practice your numbers and your letters, then soon we will be just as proficient as the best of us. Do not be ridiculous, Mary. We learned them at the same rate and progressed at the same time. Ah, but Miss Earlwood was twice as fast as me in mastering the alphabet, a far trickier thing. Well, I suppose that puts us on equal footing of sorts, won't she say? And of course, here we have Peter, Tabitha, and Colin. Now, children, I hope you have remembered your manners. The children greet you with an assortment of bows and curtsies. Very good. Now, shall we have some times tables? Yes, let's. Mary quizzes the children who are surprisingly quick with their responses. You notice that one boy is not as enthusiastic as the others. Smile at him. The boy smiles shyly back. When Mary finally finishes with the times tables, Mr. Simmons dismisses the children, who talk amongst themselves as they head toward the dining room for lunch. Miss Earlwood, it really is a pleasure to have you here. The children enjoy your company very much, and you are quite gifted with them. Not at all, Mr. Simmons. Thank you for allowing us to visit. Please, allow me to introduce my friend, Elizabeth Sharp. Miss Sharp, how do you do? So, now that I have introduced my friend, will you not reveal the identity of your benefactor? We are all dying to know. As much as I wish to oblige you, I am afraid I cannot do so. The proprietor wishes to remain anonymous, and he is the one, he is one who commands both my allegiance and respect. Oh, but we won't utter a word, truly. Miss Earlwood, please, do not ask me any further. I do not wish to betray my employer's confidence. I suppose I, yeah. I suppose I shall leave you be then for now. Mr. Simmons appears to be simultaneously relieved and a little more concerned. 
He glances at you briefly. Hmm. <laughs> Mary smiles brightly at Mr. Simmons, who appears to be most pleased, though a little uncomfortable. They begin to speak of other things, and you begin to feel a little like a chaperone. You are finally ready to leave Lambton Hall. On your way out, you encounter Colin, who is seated by a fire, nose buried within a book. Gulliver's Travel, a fine choice. Thank you, Miss Sharp. Colin continues reading his book, but he seems to be much happier. You and Mary climb into the carriage and leave Lambton Hall. Well, Elizabeth, thank you for accompanying me today. I do hope you've enjoyed yourself. The school really is a pleasant surprise, is it not? Indeed. I wish now more than ever to know the identity of this mysterious proprietor. It was a good way to pass the time. I think the more pleasant surprise is your interest in Mr. Simmons. I had only suspected it before, but today simply confirms it. Oh, Elizabeth, it is nothing. You know I must marry well, and I doubt the head schoolmaster of such a controversial place has much of either income or reputation. But alas, I shall head home. Should head home. Else I will be late for supper. Oh, and do tell Mrs. Sharp that Mama will bring over some herbs next Tuesday. Goodbye, dear Elizabeth. Hmm. Oh, Edward Ferris. His errand at Barton, in fact, was a simple one. It was only to ask Eleanor to marry him. And considering that he was not altogether blank in such a question, it might be strange that he should feel so uncomfortable in the present case, as he really did, so much in need of encouragement and fresh air. I don't remember what this word is. Oh my goodness. <laughs> what was that word? <laughs> Your visit to Lambton Hall was certainly rather interesting. Perhaps you need some time to reflect before making any judgments on the endeavor. Okay. Wow. They really want me to do these two things. And you know what? I'm not going to do them. I mean, I am. But I'm not going to do them today. So, there we go. Alright. In the next episode, we will hopefully see Mr. Graham because we saw him once today and that is not enough. So, but we got through like all of the excess like storyline before we get into like the one that we choose. So that's good. So anyway, whatever, join me next week. We will look for Mr. Graham. We will probably see Ellie and Mr. Curtis again because it looks like the game is going to make us. <laughs> And then hopefully we'll stumble upon the regiment and uh, see what happens there. So thanks for joining me and I will see you next time. Goodbye.